Good afternoon and welcome to the Racing Bet Preview for day four of the Flemington Carnival. We're finally here at the end of a long week. It's been a long but successful week so far and a quality week of racing. Of course, Melbourne Cup week at Flemington. We're looking forward to rounding out things with McKinnon Stakes Day this Saturday, Saturday, November the 7th. I'm your host, Tim Gears, joined again by Trent Kremen. Trent, we've made it this far. Can we round out the week with a few winners? Yeah, definitely. I think we've been doing quite well, um, especially in some of the big races. I think we, we nailed it at the Derby, the Melbourne Cup, all the big ones. I think we were looking to finish off strong here on Stakes Day. Yeah, we'll be taking you through our best bets of the day at Flemington on Stakes Day and then previewing the final two Group 1s of the Carnival, the Group 1 Darley Sprint and the Group 1 McKinnon Stakes. We've done, as you've just mentioned, Trent, we've done pretty solid through the Group 1 so far. I think we missed out on the Coolmore. We're about a millimetre away in the Empire Rose. We managed to find the winners of the Kennedy Cantala and the Derby. Of course, Johnny Get Angry at huge odds. We nailed the Melbourne Cup. Um, we found the winner of the Oaks on Thursday. So we're looking to continue the trend with the Daly Sprint and, of course, the McKinnon Stakes on Saturday. Uh, let's get straight into it. How do you think the track will play for the final day of the carnival? Been pretty good so far. Yeah, it has been pretty good. I thought Thursday on Oaks Day, they were just um, starting to get a little way away from the inside there. I think the rail comes out an extra two metres from the five to the seven. So that will probably, um, those two inside lanes are probably out of play now and it should go back to being quite fair. Good for again. I can't see any reason why it won't continue to play well. Well, let's get straight into things. We won't waste any time. We're going to be pretty short and sharp for this final preview. And we'll kick off with my best bets of the day. I'll be taking you through the race-by-race race preview on racingbet.com.au. My best comes up in race number five on the card, and I'm sticking with the international raider here, horse number two, Pondus, trained by Joseph O'Brien, who, of course, trained the Melbourne Cup winner on Tuesday, ridden by Damien Oliver. This horse was an enormous run in the Group 3 Bendigo Cup. Um, he settled well back in the field, carried 59 kilos, drew barrier 15. He was impeded by the horse that broke down in the race and had to come awfully wide on the turn. He still motored home to be beaten. The narrowest of margins by Princess Jenny. I think with even luck in that race, had that horse in front of him not broken down, I think he would have won this race by a couple of lengths at least. Um, and I think, you know, stepping up to 2,600 metres here, I think he looks the goods. Uh, Damien Oliver taking over from Damien Lane, draws barrier nine. Flemington should give him his opportunity. Um, the danger I do concede is the horse that was narrowly beaten in the Group 3 Geelong Cup. I think the Geelong Cup form reference is probably a touch stronger than the Bendigo Cup, um, but I'm just tipping Pondus to be a touch classier as a stayer stepping up to 2,600 metres. But I do concede that La Donne de V is the horse to beat, or at least the danger to Pondus. Um, well, if you're looking for one at longer odds, I think horse number four, Chapada, coming out of the Caulfield Cup, he was a reasonably good run. Uh, I think he can feature from a soft barrier draw. Trent, do you agree? Pondus or La Donne de V? Um, Pondus is definitely the horse to beat. I think, yeah, Flemington 2600 is a big tick. I just have a little query if it's a, a really slowly run race. He might not have a, a big enough turn of foot to really sprint with them. Um, all things being equal, I think he should win. And I agree with you. I think Chapard is probably the, the one at odds that could, um, could surprise. I thought his run in the Caulfield Cup was quite good. Worth noting as well, Pondus is two from two, second up from a spell. So from all reports from the stable, he has come on from that first up run at Bendigo. And I'm tipping if he's improved, he's definitely the horse to beat and happy to take around $2.60 available at the moment. Move on to my best value bet of the day. It's in the race prior to this, race number four on the card. And I'm with horse number nine, Sikorsky, currently $15 available for him. Uh, he just had no luck whatsoever first up from a spell in a benchmark 84 at Caulfield over 1,400 metres three weeks ago. Uh, he sat three deep the trip without cover. He was pretty firm in the market that day, around $7 into $6. So clearly he's come back well, or at least the stable think he has. And uh, as I said, just forget he went around. He sat wide throughout and uh, was never a winning hope. But I think he's going to improve here. Second up from a spell last preparation, he went close in a similar race behind Jumbo Ozaki. Um, where he settled back in the field, ran home strongly to be beaten less than a length. His only start over this track and distance was a win. He's got a good record at this distance, four starts, two wins and a second placing. And uh, look, I think this stable particularly has had a very good week um, over the Flemington Carnival. And I think it can continue here. He's a good chance, good roughly in the race at $15. That concludes my best bets of the card. We'll move on to your best bets on the card. And we'll start with your best value because... Your best bet comes up in one of the group ones later on in the card. So we'll get stuck into your best value, which comes up in race number seven, the Matriarch Stakes. 
you're keen on two horses, number four, Graceful Glamour, and number six, Paradis, which if you read Trent's uh, review of, was it Cox Plate Weekend or Caulfield Cup Weekend, you would notice that yeah, down, the bottom of, down the bottom of the article, there were some horses to follow, and both of these horses were in Trent's list. Yeah, so I just thought um, Graceful Glamour, we'll touch on her first. She could run a really big race here, stepping up to 2,000 metres. She's just... um kind of been facing wet tracks a couple of times throughout this preparation, which she, she clearly doesn't go on. Um, she was very well backed in the, um, the Mooney Valley race, three back behind Mr. Journey Perfect Jewel, and she just didn't handle the track. Then she went back to Sydney on a good track, um, led until the very shadows of the post going down by a nose to Emeralds. A few horses behind her there. Shout the Bar has come out and won a group one since. Um, Rock O'Clock was behind her there as well, has come out and won on Oaks Day impressively. So... I think the format of that race is good. Um, again, last start, she was just on a, a very soft track at the Valley and obviously didn't handle it. Stepping up 2,000 metres here, I think, is ideal. She draws barrier one for Luke Curry. She should go straight to the front here and back onto a good surface. I can see her running a big race at around $11. Um, number six, Paradis, is the other one I highlighted that I thought would be uh, really set for this race here. I thought um, in that same race at the Valley last start behind Sovereign Award where Graceful Glam was in as well, I thought she ran on really well from just beyond midfield on a on a day where it's very hard to make ground. Um, I think she's better on a good track as well. So back onto a firmer surface should suit. And I think she's, um after two runs at the mile, I think she's ready to step up to 2,000 metres now. Probably just sits midfield from barrier eight for Ollie. And I think she can be the one that's um, closing off really strongly late. So I'm happy to back both Graceful Glamour and Parody in the matriarch. Yeah, I agree with you there. I haven't done my race comments for that particular race at the moment, but looking through the fields and when I did have a brief look at the race, there were two horses I highlighted as well. So... Hopefully we can take what you mentioned a few weeks ago, targeting both these horses towards this race, and we can um, score a little bit of money through that. We'll move on to the first of the Group 1s of the day. It is the Group 1 Dali Sprint. Uh, comes up on race number six of the card. We see your best friend, one of your boyfriends here, Nature Strip, come around. Uh, he's got a lethal record down the straight. Uh, can you get your thoughts on him? Yeah, look, he's obviously a very tough horse to line up. Um, he's had his issues with preparation. He trailed outstandingly leading in, and things just haven't really gone to plan. He's had a few barrier mishaps. He had the kind of mucus issues. I thought his run in the Everest was quite good. Um, Eduardo just kind of went at a suicidal tempo out in front. Nate Strip kind of had to do all the chasing there, sitting in second. Did kind of lube into it as the winner for a couple of strides, but it was just too much of an effort there with the, the swoopers really coming late. He did a similar thing coming off last year's Everest where he ran fourth um, when he also had to do quite a bit of work in that run. And then he bounced out of that run to come here and absolutely bolted him down the straight in this race. I just think the straight track racing really suits him. He's four from five at the track, two from two at the, the 1,200 metres down the straight. I just think if, he's, if they do sit up for that first kind of 400 metres that, that can sometimes happen in straight racing, he's, just, um, he's very hard to catch when he can reel off a really big last 800 metres. So I think it's clearly between him and Bivouac, who is also coming out of the, the Everest. It was a big run there, kind of coming from worse than midfield, run on strongly for second behind Classic Legend. I think they're, um, they're clearly the two, the two horses to beat here. At the odds and just knowing Nature Strip, kind of having that pattern fourth up down the straight, I was just a bit of a sucker for pain here and, and had him on top. Yeah, I agree with the second of your thoughts there, Bivouac. I think he's ready to explode. I think he's probably short enough at around $3.40 in the market, but he's had two runs down the Flemington Strait for a victory in the new market handicap and a second behind exceedance in the Coolmore Stud Stakes. He's returned in outstanding form this preparation. Ran third to Classique Legend, first up from a spell of court. Ran second in the Everest behind Classique Legend last start. Guy tries come out of that race and won again. Obviously, the form is elite. Um, third up from a spell, back down the Flemington Strait. Firm ground. I think he's the horse to beat. Nature Strip, you can enjoy all the pain you like, but you can't tempt me into backing him. I haven't been on him all prep and I won't be jumping on here. Though I do concede the straight racing um, is a little bit scary, especially given he came out of the Everest last year and exploded down the straight. So I'll leave you to uh, get tempted by him again, but he's not one of my boyfriends. I'll be letting him go around. Um, a couple of others. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that sometimes it's a sit and sprint. They start for the first 400. I don't think that's going to happen here with the horse down the bottom, the six-year-old WA mayor Fabigino involved. How do you see it tactically with her and Nature Strip engaged? Yeah, it's tough. Um, they do look the, the two leaders here and drawn, um, drawn next to each other, Fabigino on the outside barrier, barrier 10, Nature Strip in nine. Whether Fabigino 
lets Nate Strip cross to the rail or kind of kicks up and just lets, um, kind of takes the rail herself and holds Nate Strip out. I'm not really sure. I've kind of got Nate Strip actually getting to the front and getting to the rail and Fabergino maybe just playing a touch conservatively to try and run out a strong 1200, but it could go either way there. Um, yeah, both of them, well, Fabergino especially, doesn't mind a dogfight. She'll, she'll be happy to sit there and eyeball Nate Strip if, if Geordie Childs wants to. Um, but I think, yeah, they probably will go along at a, a decent clip here. Um, I'm not sure how you saw it there, but that's kind of what I've got happening. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think they'll be looking to take a sit on her. I think they'll be happy to just to go along at a solid clip with Nature Strip. Don't think they'll be too scared of him. That's how she races best. I thought potentially the value in the race was Libertini also coming out of the Everest. She sat wide without cover throughout the Everest, and it's notable that she was $9 into $6 for that race. So clearly she was very well thought of. Uh, you only have to look at what she did first up from a spell where she absolutely bashed Classic Legend. Um, three week freshen up, I like. Uh, five out of six on firm ground. D Oliver jumps off Graf to jump on Libertini. So seven dollars is a price I could get tempted about with her. Now the horse I've just mentioned, Graf. I want you to take me through your thoughts on him. Um, first after Danny O'Brien came out and won the Caulfield Sprint, can he go and measure up to Group One company here? He's a bit of an en an enigma. This horse. Yeah, it might be more of an enigma than nature strip here, this horse graph. Um, yeah, look, Danny O'Brien seems to have worked his magic with him. His win first up over a thousand meters was was very good. Um, you know, he recorded some some very strong late splits in that race. He has to do it again here at 1200 meters down the straight, which is a whole different race to kind of drawing wide around Caulfield and just getting last crack at them. John Barrier one here might be a little bit tricky um, come last day of the carnival. I thought he was probably the knockout chance, but I'd just like to see him do it again at this at this real elite level, just to see if he's um really become a contender or, or a pretender as he as he once was. Now you jumped on Twitter this afternoon and put out a tweet that I'm sure is probably going to divide attention, uh, divide opinions. Zutori, you said he's about as short as you've ever seen a runner that should be in a Group One. You're happy to lay him for the place. Take us through your thoughts there. He's won his first two starts this preparation. Yeah, and they're both at the track and distance, which is why he's probably so short in the market. Um, you know, he is a very good straight track horse. I've got no knock on that. But I think just going back through his runs, like his first up run in the in the Bobby Lewis, I think he's probably a better fresh horse as well. So he, he did manage to hold that on to that race by 0 0.2 lengths to Banquo, who's come out and failed since down the straight. Tefane was kind of just getting warm late there first up. Um, not too much else in the race there. In the last start in the Gill guy, again, he only won by a nose there by 0 0.1 links. And I think Tefane was a, a moral beaten in that race. Really should have won if she had any luck. Dollar for dollar was just whacking away there. He ran last in the Everest. Um, Sandra and Elaine again was just first up under getting warm late. I just think that the form is lengths inferior. We saw Tefane was beaten up in the Everest. You know, probably not at her best there, but even still, I just think um, Zatori is a group two horse at best. And this is the elite group one sprinters that we have minus classic legend. And I was pretty happy to to be really against him here. I'd have him clearly longer than the $12 that he is now. Okay, final runner, I'll get your thoughts on quickly before we move on to the McKinnon Stakes. Hey, Doc, you were very keen about him in the Manicato, um, but you don't seem to be replicating those thoughts here. Yeah, big soft spot for, for Hey, Doc. I just think that the Manicato kind of was his target race. I've said, said it all along. Um, third up in the Manicato, he got a, a good run on a, on a hot speed on a on a really firm track there. I think this is a, a stronger race. He had trekking kind of coming off there, which is from the Everest form, but trekking perhaps was just a touch flat off that, off that backup of the Everest run. Um, has one down the straight before, but it was in a much inferior race. I just think he might get found out a touch here against the, the real elite sprinters here and maybe just uses it a bit of a, a platform run for the winter bottom in Perth at his next start. So happy enough to be against him, but he'll, he'll run well as he always does. Okay, to, so to sum up the Daly Sprint Classic, I'm with Bivouac and Libertini and Trent is keen on his boyfriend, Nature Strip, and also saving on Bivouac, who he labels as the main danger in the race. We'll move on to the next group one, the final group one of the carnival. It's race number eight on the card, the group one McKinnon Stakes over 2,000 metres. Trent, pretty simply, is Arcadia Queen the best bet of the carnival? Oh, she's... I don't know. She's close to it, I think. I've got the slight query on her coming out of the Cox Plate where, you know, she's she had a tough run on a wet track there. Um, but 
we were just talking off air before, if, if she wasn't right, they wouldn't be running her here, surely. There'd be no need. She got a group one in spring already. I just think that she has to be spot on to be racing here. And if she's at her best here, they will not beat her. Yeah, I tend to agree. Um, and I hope she is because, like, her running them in the in the uh, Cox Plate, I'll get it out eventually, her running the Cox Plate was enormous and, and awfully brave after she nearly came down at the 1,000-metre mark, clipped heels, nearly fell. She still chased hard to run fifth. Um, obvious, obviously, that is the best form line coming into this race. She's going to get her preferred track conditions. It'll be a firm deck come race eight on the final day of the carnival. Drawn ideally for Luke Curry in barrier five. If she brings her best, I think she'll be winning. Um, talk to me about Melody Bell. She comes back over to Melbourne after failing um, earlier in the year. She's gone back to New Zealand, won back-to-back group ones, comes back across the Tasman to Flemington. She went very close in this race last year. Yeah, she did. She was a, a huge run last year behind Magic Wand. I think this is probably a, a slightly stronger race um, this year with a few horses coming out of the Cox Plate. Just didn't really know what to make of her. I think she actually seems to do her best racing um, this way of going. A lot of her runs in New Zealand and in Melbourne have been better than her ones in Sydney. Her run last start in the Livermore Classic over 2,000 metres was, was very good. It was an effortless Group 1 win. Just on a very firm deck here um, in a potentially stronger race than what she's kind of saw last year. I just thought she was, you could probably take her on here. I know she's, you know, she's a very good mare and she's won something ridiculous, like 14 group ones or whatever it is. 12, 12 um, group ones. 12 group ones, yeah. I just, I'm just not sure about it here on a firm deck in a stronger race, coming off those kind of issues that she had in Sydney, going back to New Zealand, coming back here is potentially a, a little bit of an afterthought. I'm not really sure what to make of her hair. I was just, um, you know, you can't back them all and I had to had to take her on at the price. Yep, I agree with you. Uh, Mugger too, he was a, another big run in the Cox Plate. Can he, that probably showed that he's up to this weight for age group one level. Um, can he come out of there and win his first group one here? Well, yeah, he can. He's he's not hopeless at all. Um, It was a very good run in the Cox Plate. He was kind of caught quite wide, had to come really wide on the turn. And was, you know, doing really well there to, to run fourth just ahead of Arcadia Queen. I think he was probably a touch better suited on the on the day there, despite racing wide. Um, he's probably more adept on soft ground than Arcadia Queen is. And also just kind of off that brutally run run race. He was coming out of a 2,400 metre race. He's probably a better stayer than Arcadia Queen. So it was potentially just a, a touch stronger laid off that strong tempo. Um, you know, he started a big price there. $26 Arcadia Queen was hard in the market. I think... On a on a firm deck, all things being equal, I think Arcadia Queen has his measure. So I was um I was pretty enough pretty happy to be with Arcadia Queen over Mugger too. But he is obviously a, a good winning chance. Okay, and the final horse I want to mention, uh, which I think is a value in the race, is horse number two fifty stars. Finally getting up to two thousand meters this preparation. Fourth up, he's won over this track and distance previously. Um, loves the Flemington Straight. I think you know he's running the Cantal. It was good running on strong from the back of the field. Prior to that, he ran he raced well as well in the Munga. Um, I think he's ready to strike now. Fourth up, up to two thousand meters at double figure odds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think he's the the saver or something you can the horse you can have something on as well as Arcadia Queen. He's been set for this race um, specifically on the quick back up at the Flemington two thousand meters. We saw what he did in the autumn in the Group One Australia Cup. Um, where he defeated Regal Power off the, the exact same setup coming off a, a quick back up, up to the Flemington 2,000 metres there. So I think um, you know, he's going to get back. He probably wants a little bit wetter. He's not hopeless on good tracks, but he does like to get his toe in a little bit. Um, he'll get back and he's going to be set to peak here, whereas a few of these are potentially coming off out of their grand finals maybe. Maybe he's not quite as classy, but he is going to be the one at 100% here. And I think you definitely have to have something on him at double figures. Okay, so the McKinnon Stakes, me and Trent both on the same page there. Arcadia Queen, clearly the horse to beat. And uh, Trent, that's your best bet of the day. And uh, 50 stars, the value at $10. Any other thoughts on the McKinnon Stakes Day card? No, I just hope we get to see Arcadia Queen uh, go home a winner and that'll end off what has been an outstanding spring carnival. Beautiful work, mate. So we'll have a race-by-race preview up on racingbet.com.au. I'll be taking care of that one to try and find you the winners on the last day of the carnival. And Trent will be responsible for the two runner-by-runner previews of both Group 1s, the Daly Spring Classic and the McKinnon Stakes. So you can find all of that up online on racingbet.com.au. 
Hope you've had a terrific carnival. Hope you've enjoyed the preview shows. We'll continue these next week, but good luck for the final day of the Flemington Carnival.